worship our God this morning. It says in Psalm 18, suddenly God, you floodlight my life. I'm blazing with glory, God's glory. I smash the bands of marauders. I vault the highest fences. What a God. His road stretches straight and smooth. Every God direction is road tested. Everyone who runs towards him makes it. That's you and me this morning pointed towards God. We make it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Pastors Brian and Bobby are back, and uh, so glad to have them here. I know they've been traveling around to a lot of our global churches around the place and just being a blessing, and always grateful to you, church, for releasing them to do what God has called them to do, and I know that we're blessed this morning to have Pastor Brian bringing the word, and it's going to be unreal. But why don't you take a moment right now, you can say hello to someone, Maybe a high five, maybe even a kiss. Try your luck, see how you go. And then you can grab a seat. Very good. But listen, right now we're going to come around our tires and our offering. Bobby's going to come up and share around the giving. Why don't you welcome her this morning? Bobby? Mum. Mother to you. <laughs> Just respectful. It's all right. How are you, church? I'm going to sit down and uh, do this this morning. Is that okay? Are you well? It's good to have Brian home, hey? He's got a great word prepared for us. A, a great word prepared. Hey, so you know what? As for, um, Ben... Ben said, we're gathering around our tithe and our offering. So you can begin to prepare for that if you wish. And again, if you're new or visiting, we just um, encourage you just to enjoy the moment, allow it to pass by or contribute. You're so welcome to do either. Hallelujah. I'm going to read you some verses from 2 Corinthians. But you know what? Agree with me, church or not? Agree with me, actually. But you know what? We worship a God who's generous, right? Completely and utterly generous. 
And you know what? He's created us in his image to also be generous. And to that end, he gives us the word of God and he teaches us in scripture how to do that, how to begin that process and then live in the revelation of that. So here in um, Corinthians, it says in the message, remember, a stingy planter gets a stingy crop. A lavish planter gets a lavish crop. I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over and make up your own mind what you will give. That will protect you against sob stories and arm twisting. God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways so that you're ready for anything and everything, more than just ready to do what needs to be done. As one psalmist puts it, he, God, throws caution because he can, because he's a generous, resourced God. He throws caution to the winds, giving to the needy in reckless abandon. His right living, right giving ways never run out, never wear out. That's God's intent for us. So here we go. This most generous God, who here we go, gives seed to the farmer like you and I, that becomes bread for your meals, is more than extravagant with you. He gives you something you can then give away, which grows into full-formed lives, robust in God, wealthy in every way, so that you can be generous in every way, producing with us great praise to God. Hallelujah. Amen. So you know what? In our hands today, right now, most of us in this room, we have something. God has put something. He gives to all of us a measure, a measure with which we can begin these processes and then grow in the revelation and power of that. And so we have something in our hand and it's powerful. Amen. It has the capacity to become astonishing, not only in our own lives, but on the earth and um, to the recipients it's going to reach actually through the work of the church and the kingdom. Hallelujah. So it's a powerful thing. Allow me to pray for you. Have you got it in your hand, church? We love you so much. Allow me to pray for you yet again. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you that you trust us and that you invite us to be a part of your great end time harvest. And we know, Lord, that this tithe and this offering, this first fruit from our lives to you honors you, but it also facilitates your will on the earth. And so, Lord, we pray that you will bless it abundantly, bless the givers and bless the house and the vision that receives it, that we might fulfill your will on the earth in Jesus' name. Amen. And all the uh, amazing radical people said? <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, our hosts are going to serve us. And on the screen, we have a beautiful story of a young woman in our church, Ashley, who um, has got something wonderful to say. She's part of sisterhood and part of everything that's happening here. So watch that. Amen. Amen. We love your church. School was quite a confusing time for me. I really struggled with my identity. I was bullied um, probably from the moment that I walked into school until pretty much the moment I left. There was just times where people would be laughing at me and mocking me for being a Christian and, you know, standing up for Christ and the times where, you know, I tried to fit in with them, go to the same parties and hang out spots that they did, I would get mocked and laughed at for being a hypocrite. And, you know, this was just such a confusing thing for me because you know, I, I had the understanding that Christ valued me, but I knew that other people didn't. You know, I remember as a as a you know a Miss Sisterhood team walking into a color conference, and and that sense of community and family that that the sisterhood brings to you as a young person. You know, even as a young person that has sensed insecurities and loneliness. You know, like that, those things just don't go away. I remember making a decision to let go of um, some things in my life that have really been holding me back and to really trust God. And the, the Spirit of God was actually what was going to free me from my insecurities. And I remember, you know, crying out to God and saying, God, help me to, you know, not look back. I now had to make the choice to enter into the freedom that He'd already given me when I said yes to Christ. Ever since I made that decision, I have had wonderful doors of opportunity open up for me to actually make a difference in people's lives. And I really felt that the call that was upon my life was to actually set the captives free. And it's crazy to think that I was actually once captive, but Christ set me free. Being a part of the sisterhood for me is just an understanding to be there for others. It's something that's greater than myself, and that's exactly what sisterhood's about. Cool, huh?
Great story from a great girl in our church who just got married as well, which is exciting. Um, it's beautiful. It's what church is all about, huh? We love God, an incredible God. We love people and doing what we can as a church to see people find just answers in Him. And I love seeing stories like that. Well, there is always plenty of great things coming up in church. So have a look at the screen. Check out Church, church News. your 2014 Hillsong Foundation commitment, you can do so this weekend by filling in the card on your seat or logging on to myhillsong.com and click on My Giving. That guy out there, I reckon what he wants is other people to surf with. That couple over there, sitting down, I bet they're asking, are we going to do the right way as a couple? What is it that could help us make right decisions in our marriage? That guy, reading his paper? I bet he's just trying to figure out, how do I find out more about Jesus? Whatever season you find yourself in, the next step is yours. Well, g'day, it's Sanger here. We're here for the Man Up Men's Conference Challenge. And I know some men, they've written in and they've told us what their fears are. And we're out the front of Vincent's house. He doesn't even know we're here, but we're about to go and knock on his door, and we're going to go and face his fears. Well, he is. We're going to watch. Let's do it. G'day, mate. Come on out here. Is it, are, you, are you Vincent? Yes, I am. Oh, fantastic. Oh, Come out here. no way. Tell us what your fear is. Snakes. Mmm, snakes. Snakes. Oh, freak! <laughs> Oh, I'm freaking out right now. We're just oh, bringing in no. a small snake. Oh, no, man. Right and now, oh, Vincent, what we're going to do is we're just oh. going to sit the snake around. No, you. No, yeah. no, 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 please, no. Yeah, right, now don't move, Vincent. Oh, just take it easy. Oh, no. Look at that, Vincent. Oh, I think it's because we've got my hand. No, <laughs> All right, well, what we're going to do right now is we're going to get you to eat just a few snakes. Just one little bit of real snake. Oh, right. Yeah, that's it. Start putting them down. Once you finish the snakes, we'll let the big one off you. You're kidding. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, there was a lot in there. <laughs> oh, you're a big boy. Look at that. Well, he's done it. Vincent has conquered these fears at the Man Up Men's Conference Challenge. He's eaten a pack of snakes while hanging on to his favourite pet snake. Oh, You're thinking he's going to take home with you, are you, Vincent? No. No, he loves it. Absolutely having the time of his life here. He's won two tickets to the Men's Conference for this year. We'll see you there. Face your fears, men. Ah, oh, you got to have fun in church. And... So nice to be home, and right now we're linking with our church right across Melbourne, of course, and uh, all the way around our Sydney extension services and campuses. And thank God for the opportunity we have to gather around the name of Jesus. And you never quite know what might happen in church, as Vince found out. He's part of the family, and uh, well, the men's conference is going to be incredible. And again, It'll be full of the unexpected, but one thing I fully expect is people will have their lives impacted. Men's worlds will be changed in a powerful, positive way. So thank God for that. And it's so nice to be home. It's been a long time, and I almost forgot what you all look like. But praise God. It's great to hear the good reports of all that's been happening. Of course, big day in Australia, new government, new prime minister, and uh, we're not a political church. People have various... Uh, beliefs and I know even on our team and staff there's people who vote on different sides but the reality is uh, it's very rare for Australia to get a new government since the Second World War it's only happened seven times and uh, we have a new Prime Minister his name's Tony Abbott of course and uh, we're going to pray for Australia we're going to pray for our Prime Minister for the government and believe for the days ahead to be days where well righteousness exalts the nation the bible says so let's believe for god to have his way in our country and uh, really believe for uh, australia's you know strong moral foundations to be held on to and to see 
Look, you know, just God have his way. In what is the best country in the world? I'm in a good position to say it because I travel a lot, seen many parts of the world, but there's only one Australia. And uh, I can say proudly in the words of was it Peter Allen, I still call Australia home. Praise God. So we're going to pray. I'm going to ask Mark Hopkins, the vice executive, whatever he is, of the Bible College to come on up here. And he is going to lead us in prayer for our country right across the church. Let's stand to our feet. Let's believe God for Australia in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's pray, church. Father, we are so thankful that, Lord, we live in a free country. And, Lord, this morning we lift up our Prime Minister, Tony Abbott. And, Lord, we lift up every member of Parliament to you. And we ask that you would have your way in each and every one of their lives. And we believe, Father, that this would be an amazing time of your blessing into this nation, into this time, into this season, that, God, you would raise up godly men and women to lead this place, to lead this nation. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for it. Amen. 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 <laughs> and if I could just mention, especially the Western campus, the new campus and campuses in the west of Melbourne, because you've just joined in to become part of Hillsong Church, and can't wait to get down there and meet you guys personally. Fantastic. We've got big things happening Sunday nights. This month, we've got these diversity nights. So, for example, here at the Hills Campus tonight, there's an Islander theme. And there'll be, there'll be, well, who knows? I know outside there's going to be a hungy, but there'll be all sorts of things that relate to the Pacific Islands. And nothing like a good, better culture coming in. So, come along. It'll be a great night. Bring friends. And I uh, already know there's going to be some pretty powerful elements to tonight. But the word will go forward. The gospel will be preached. People's lives will be impacted. We're believing for the Holy Spirit to move. It's going to be a great night. So whether you're having a Latino night or Asian night, da, 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 whatever it is, it'll be a great night. <laughs> Incredible. I was trying to do a little, you know, Mandarin. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Thanks, Pete, for following me and backing me up like that. We're a team. Okay, okay. So also tonight, I'm going to make a very important special announcement that affects the future direction and vision of our church. So don't miss that. Come along. And if you know people from church, get them to come tonight. And uh, we're going to talk about something significant in the future. You guys can be seated. All of our fuel AM, year six, seven, is it? Young people heading off to your fuel AM. That's a nice backdrop I can see behind me there. Look, looks like I'm in Westminster Cathedral today. <laughs> Did you know while I was awake, by the way, I had the chance to interview the Archbishop of Canterbury the worldwide head of the uh, Anglican Church. And uh, he's a man of God. He's a, literally an evangelical, spirit-filled believer. And uh, so thank God it was a great, great honor to have that chance. We sing a lot of great songs in our church. I love many of the songs that are written and come out of the life of our church. And oftentimes, the songs that we sing are built around the themes that we're preaching in church. And this year, since... Or since Easter, I've been, in fact, just preaching some of the biblical perspective behind many of the songs we sing. And it's always encouraging when you see that the words that we sing, they're not just a whole lot of collated, inspirational thoughts. They're founded deeply in the Word of God. And uh, so it's a great chance for us as we sing and praise God to confess God's Word. And one of those songs that we've been singing, we began our service this morning with a song, Your Love is Relentless. It's a beautiful song, and I want to speak about being recipients of a relentless love. How does that feel? What does that mean to be a recipient of a relentless love? So if you think about the word relentless, I wonder what you would relate relentlessness to. 
I think about two or three years ago when I was in New York in a hotel room late at night and turned on the TV right as the broadcasting began in real life time talking about an earthquake and then a potential tsunami in Japan and watch literally as off the eastern coast the northeastern coast of Japan a tsunami hit and to see it literally come and to just, to just devastate all the boats in the harbor and then watch it come across the beach and then onto the land and to see anything that was in its wake swept away. It was relentless. I mean, houses and buildings literally were being caught up and swept away. And you could see it moving across fields and everywhere it went across fields, you could see roads and cars. And sure enough, it would relentlessly just break through and across the banks and across the roads and any kind of human activity, anything that was in its way, it seemed to just be unforgiving unyielding, unbending, it was relentless. As a matter of fact, that's what relentless means. It means to be unbending, to be unceasing, to be unyielding. So what does a relentless love look like? Synonyms for the word relentless are things like ferocious. And it's funny, isn't it? We're talking about the love of God. And yet relentless means ferocious, dogged, fierce, Ruthless, single-minded, uncompromising, unstoppable, unflinching. One word in particular I find interesting when it comes to defining relentless, and that's the word unforgiving. Relentlessness is described as unforgiving, and yet we're talking about a relentless love, and God's love is all forgiving. So here's a contradiction. It's an oxymoron. It's literally an un unforgivingly forgiving love unforgivingly forgiving love the love of God it is relentless love as a matter of fact if you want to talk about love and its capacity to be relentless to keep coming at you to literally overtake you to overwhelm you to be unceasing and unyielding to just sweep you up in a love that's beyond human capacity to fully understand, then we need to understand that the relentless love that I'm speaking about and that we sing about when we sing your love is relentless. It is a love which is entirely God's domain. You see, it's a love that is 70 times seven. When Jesus was asked, how many times should we forgive? Seven times? And Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. So in other words, he was talking about a forgiveness that is relentless. It just keeps coming. It keeps coming. It keeps coming. It doesn't stop. It is relentless. 70 times 7. Well, that's superhuman. We may have the potential to forgive and to forgive again and forgive again to a point. But there comes a time when the relentless nature of God's love and the forgiveness it represents, it is unforgivingly forgiving. That's the kind of love that's coming at you when you think about the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, most powerfully and perfectly illustrated on the cross and through his resurrection life. It is a love that is, uh, well, it is beyond us even in terms of our emotional capacity. I mean, unforgiving, forgiving love. The kind of love that is relentless loves where there is no love. Yeah. It loves where there's absolute disinterest, even hostility, and the love that Christ has toward the world while we are still sinners. Christ died for us. It's a love that comes at us even though it is no return. And you know, we're not wired to just relentlessly love and love and love and love when all that's coming back at us is coldness or hostility so you get a feeling that the love of christ it is not just a natural love it's not just a very special very special type of love it is the unrelenting unforgivingly forgiving love of the lord jesus christ i many years ago i remember one woman and There'd be other stories like this in our church. And, well, she was a Christian, but her husband walked out on her and took off with somebody else. And never forget, just her hoping against hope and just 
keeping on believing for him to come back and just loving where there was no return. There was just void and coldness coming back. And we're not wired for that kind of rejection. And so the relenting nature of God's love, it actually exceeds our emotional capacity. It's an unqualified love. It's not based on my performance. God doesn't love me because of how I perform and how I act. He loves me. 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 He unforgivingly loves me. Lovey loves me. Loves me. It's a different level of love altogether. In fact, it is a love that is beyond our ability to, well, to appreciate, to conceive. It's a love, in fact, that beyond our thinking, beyond our comprehension. You see, the love of God, it's infinite. It's an infinite love. We're finite beings. So we can understand love and experience love at different levels. But if I talk about the relenting love of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not at one of those levels. It's beyond my contra- comprehension. It overwhelms me. It overflows. It overwhelms the love of Christ. It can overtake you. What a wonderful thing. It's described in Romans chapter 8, verse 35, which is asking the question, what could separate us from the love of Christ? In verse 35, Romans 8, it says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, tribulation that is, shall distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Verse 37 goes on, says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. And where is the power of our conquering overcoming victory through him who loved us. It's his relentless love that enables us to be conquerors, to overcome the things this world would try to throw at us. Goes on, next verse, says, For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. There is a description of relentless love. No matter what is coming against you, is it famine, persecution, opposition, tribulation, trial, nakedness, peril, sword, and all these things we are made overcomers through the love of Christ. That's why we need to overcome Open our hearts and open our lives up to a love that's not based on anything that we deserve. It's based entirely on who Christ is. Psalm 136. It's one of those psalms that in many churches, whoever is leading the service will quote the verse and then there's a refrain. And the congregation will come back with the refrain. Well, today... I want you to come back with the refrain in Psalm 136, verse 1 to 3. And let's do so with a sense of conviction. Here it goes. It says, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Give thanks to the God of God. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords. His love endures forever. It's a relentless love. So wonderful. Do you know, the words of the song go like this. Think about these lyrics in line with relentless love. It says, salvation sounds a new beginning. Relentless love is filled with new beginnings. Brand new chapters, brand new beginnings. As distant hearts begin believing. Redemption's bid is unrelenting. Your love goes on. Your love goes on. When the world gives way, you carry us, you carry us. When the world gives way, you cover us, you cover us. You may not be enjoying my singing, but what are you going to do about it? I'm the pastor. I may get hauled up before the board. Stop singing in church. No, because they are recipients of a relentless love. So that means they're dispensers of a relentless 
love. <laughs> you carry us when the world gives way. You cover us with your endless grace. Your love is relentless. The time is up for chasing shadows. You gave the world a light to follow, a hope that shines beyond tomorrow. Your love goes on. Tearing, tearing through the veil of darkness. Breaking every chain, you set us free. Fighting for the furthest heart. I love that. The idea of a relentless love that is fighting for the furthest heart. You gave your life for all to see. A relentless love. You know, Solomon, in his wisdom, he talked about the relentless love of God to his father, David. And it's described, actually, in 2 Kings, 1 Kings, rather, chapter 8, verse 23 and on. And if I read it from the Message Bible, it gives a picture of God's relentless love. It says in these verses, as I read through them, there is no God like you in the skies above or on the earth below who unswervingly keeps covenant, unswervingly keeps keeps covenant with his servants and relentlessly loves them. Relentlessly loves them as they sincerely live in obedience to your way. Listen to what it goes on here and says. It says, you kept your word to David, my father, your personal word. You did exactly what you promised, every detail. David was the recipient of God's relentless love in his failings, in his mistakes, in his battles, and in his challenges. He was a recipient of God's relentless love. And so are you. And so are I. And David, not only was he a recipient of the relentless love of God, but he also, in many ways, the way he lived is a picture of the love of God. When it came to David as a young man, he lived when Saul was king, and of course, one of the great stories of the Bible, as a young man, he overtook a giant. His name was Goliath. As a result of that, the people's hearts turned towards David as the potential leader, the potential king. And Saul, while well, he was a king, he was filled with insecurity and led out of his insecurities and out of his fears. And so he began to persecute David. He began to chase David. He began to try to destroy David. And yet in the middle of it, David stayed consistent in his love. Relentless love is consistent, even in the world of inconsistency. So just this love that David was able to keep, he never retaliated, never looked for retribution. He just continued to love. And then when it came to Saul's son, whose name was Jonathan, David and he built a great friendship. And out of that friendship came a covenant. A covenant in Bible times, Old Testament times, it is the highest form of trust, of commitment, of loyalty. Well, Jonathan, he had every reason to want to enter into a covenant with David. It was a love covenant. Remember, God, he keeps covenant. And the reason Jonathan would be king, to enter into a covenant, the covenant being that David would never harm his family, Jonathan's family, that David would be kind to Jonathan and to his family. And uh, he had every reason because David was to be the next king. And in Bible times, bloodthirsty times, when a new dynasty came in, when there was a new regime, the old regime, they were wiped out. The new king, he would wipe out all that had gone before to wipe out any possibility of a revolt. Tragically, there's still parts of the world that operate something like that now. That's why we ought to thank God we live in Australia. A great country. Well, he entered into this covenant. And, do you know, it was a covenant that many years later, well after both Saul and Jonathan were dead, they died in a battle called Jezreel, the Battle of Jezreel on a mountain called Guboa. And uh, many years after that, David was remembering his covenant. He wanted to keep his covenant. You see, his love was relentless. God's love towards you is relentless. And eventually, David asks the question, 
It's a question many years after both Saul and Jonathan were dead. He said, is there anyone, is there anyone, 2 Samuel chapter 9 verse 1, from the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness or to whom I can show love. Some of you may have heard of a guy who's hard to preach about because his name's difficult to say. And when you have to say it over and over and over again, it can become a tongue twister. His name was Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. There's a name for you. Any young mums, fathers, about to have a baby, you want to give them a biblical name, what about Mephibosheth? Good, strong Bible name. Mephibosheth. Everyone say Mephibosheth. Here's the story. I want you to catch it. It's 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. It says, Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called Ziba to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, At your service. The king said, Is there not still someone? Is there anyone? Of the house of Saul, to whom I may show the kindness of God. In other words, to show relentless love. And Ziba said to the king, Well, there's still a son of Jonathan who was lame in his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he's in the house of Machir, Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lo Debar. Meshubbeth, this grandson of Saul, was in Lo Debar. And you know, Lo Debar was a place where Debar was set very low. As you can see, my humor has improved greatly while I've been away. Lo Debar, where Debar was set very low. Well, going on with the story. Here he is, living, alienated, isolated, and fully vulnerable, lame in his feet, in a house belonging to Machir, in a town called Lo Debar. King David, verse 5, sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lo Debar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, you can see his heritage. He was literally the grandson of Saul had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, here is your servant. And David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you. Remember, he had every, every reason to fear naturally, because this could well, outside of a relentless love, have been the end of his days, the end of his life. Because that was culturally what would happen, and his descendants were wiped out. He said, don't be afraid. So when he fell on his face and prostrated himself, David says, Mephibosheth, he answered, here's your servant. David said, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat at the bread, eat bread at my table continually. When he bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? Described himself as a dead dog. That's how he saw himself. And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house. You therefore and your servants and your sons shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son, Mephibosheth, will have food to eat. He says, Mephibosheth shall eat bread at my table always. Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. So Mephibosheth, he's far removed, far removed from his background, his place of royalty, his grandson of King Saul. He's actually hiding. He's in shame in this place called Lodabar. Well, do you know, it's a powerful story. The song that we sing in our church, your love is relentless. It starts like this. Salvation sounds a new beginning. 
as distant hearts begin believing. It talks about new beginnings. You know, the message of Christ is a message of new beginnings. There's no area of your life where if you open your life up to the Word of God and to the love of God, you can't know a new beginning. I pray we will always have faith as a church to see multitudes of people inviting Jesus, allowing salvation to sound a new beginning. Let's pray that anywhere in that church where we see people in their tens giving their lives to Christ and experiencing relentless love, that it'll become hundreds. And where it's hundreds, let's believe it'll become thousands. And where it's thousands, let's believe it'll become tens of thousands. We are about new beginnings. New beginnings. And for Mephibosheth, David suddenly appearing and wanting to show love to him, it represented a new beginning. If you looked at it, naturally speaking, his life was over. He was crippled. He had nothing really to live for. Had no momentum in his life. He, uh, his very reason for existence was compromised. It was kind of gone. So it represented a new beginning. I love this. We're singing as distant hearts begin believing. You couldn't be more distant than Mephibosheth was. You see, I talk about low Debar, where Debar, where Debar was set very low. Well, you know what it means? Low means no, Debar means word. He literally was in a place where there was no word. And he was there a slave because he lived in the house of Matia, Makia. And it literally means, the, the word literally means to be sold in the sense of slavery. So he was living in bondage as a slave in a place where there was no word. And yet it was in that place that this relentless love suddenly came toward him and found him and called him out in a place where there was no word. You know, you can be so distant when it comes to the promise of God. And could I encourage you to make sure that every area of your life where perhaps there's bondage, where it seems like you're a slave to something that you never intended to be a slave. Maybe even in the area of finance, you find yourself a slave to debt. And the greatest thing you can do is to open up that area of your life to the Word of God. Live by the Word of God. Because oftentimes, it's the fact that there is no Word in that realm of our life that is keeping us in bondage. John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. The truth shall set you free. So where there is no word, there's not freedom, there's bondage. I love 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, because, well, Paul, he found himself in chains. He was bound. But listen to what he says. For which I suffer trouble as an evildoer. In other words, they're accusing me of being evil. Even to the point of chains. But the word of God. But the word of God. But the word of God is not chained. Paul was in chain, but God's word, God's promise could not be chained. So if you find yourself in Lodabar, you find yourself where, well, you're bound. And there seems to be no way. Open up to the Word of God. If you've closed areas of your life to living by God's Word. You see, the truth is, it's because Mephibosheth was abiding or living or dwelling where there was no Word that he found himself in bondage. The Word of God cannot, will not, shall not be chained. Amen. Salvation sounds a new beginning as distant hearts. You could be living so far, so distant from God. You could have people in your world who are living so distant from God, but never underestimate the power of God's Word. It is quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And believe me, in these last days, God can do a quick work. And you believe God for the Word of God to impact your friends and your loved ones or impact areas of your own life. And God 
God, its word is quick. In other words, it is sharp. It is more powerful and sharp than a two-edged sword. So beautiful. Again, the song we're singing about, chasing shadows. What does that mean, to be chasing shadows? Chasing shadows. The time is up for chasing shadows. Mephibosheth. <laughs> Let's just call him Fibber for short. <laughs> Though he wasn't that. Mephibosheth, he uh, not only was in this place of no word, his name actually means shame. He's living in shame. Verse 6 described him as Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul. So there was shame attached to to his very name. He's literally chasing shadows, fearing for his life, hiding with the possibility that his true identity would be exposed. Maybe there was a sense of shame because of his physical disfigurement, but more likely there was shame because, well, his own identity, if it was exposed, would mean destruction. You ever had areas in your life or have you ever been like that in life where you live in fear of your real identity being discovered? There's people here and perhaps there's things that relate to your background and things that relate to your life. And you live in fear of things being exposed. You live in fear of perhaps being judged. Tragically, my, my dad, who I loved, his life ended in, in shame. But can I tell you honestly that I'm not going to live my life chasing shadows. I'm not going to live my life living through the weight and power of shame. The Bible actually says the father won't answer for the son, the son won't answer for the father. I'm going to live my life according to God's relentless love. I'm going to live my life understanding that I can head my, help, hold my head up high, that I can praise God in spirit and in truth, understanding that God is a God who will enable us to be free from the power of chasing shadows. You don't have to live in the shadow when you know Jesus. I was talking to a pastor a few years ago. And he's a friend of mine. And, well, things were starting to emerge about his background, his past, and these were things that related to before he was even a born-again believer. And it, he was living in fear that certain things would come up and that certain things would, uh, would, would be exposed. And I could only encourage him to understand that he doesn't have to spend his life chasing shadows. He's a son of God. And God's love is relentless. So we don't have to live our lives in low debar, distant from God's will and God's purpose. We don't have to live our lives ruled by things that would try to bind us. We don't have to live our lives chasing shadows. The song that we're singing, your love is relentless. The time is up for chasing shadows. If you were the only person in my congregation, I would be happy. And if you're in one of our other campuses or extension services, because I got one lonely cheer from one faithful, encouraging saint over here, <laughs> whose love is relentless. So the song goes, when your world gives, up, gives way, you, you carry us, you carry us, when our world gives way. Can I tell you, Mephibosheth, the world gives its way, represents really his whole condition in life. You see, he was lame, he was crippled. His legs had given away. It happened when he was a five-year-old boy. As a five-year-old boy, right at the time that his grandfather and his father were killed in that battle on Mount Gilboa, his nurse, he took him, and she ran to try to protect him because she thought that he was in grave danger. Naturally speaking, he would have been. So she ran, but in running, in running, she found herself 
uh, well, he fell and he ended up crippled, lame. Couldn't walk five years old now. It's much later in his life. And he's still living crippled and lame. And so in that sense, his world gave way. The story is in 2 Samuel chapter 4 and in verse 4. And you know, the truth is, there can be things in our world and our lives that attempt to cripple us. I love the way Paul described Jesus to, well, in Athens, philosophers who were looking for a God who they described as the unknown God. And Paul says, God's not far from any one of us. In him we live, we move, and we have our being. Life in Christ means you were created to live, not to hide, not to live in shame, not to be living with, you know, the thing in your life which represented the world giving way. No, you were called to live. Life is for living. God created you to live. I am come that you might have life and to move. What area of your life have you lost mobility, lost momentum? It seems like, well, things have just come to a halt because I believe in the name of Jesus, a relentless love. It's a love that can cause you to live where there should only be death. It's a love that can cause you to move where all momentum seems to have been lost. God can bring momentum into your career. He can bring momentum into your future. He can give momentum to areas of your life where it seems perhaps that all momentum is lost. I believe as a church, we're called to be a church with momentum, forward progressing momentum, where we literally are seeing new beginnings, where we are see new opportunities try to believe in God for that for your life and especially where the world gives way in him you live move have your being his very reason his very hope for existence Mephibosheth his reason for being was threatened but you know God had a way for him one more line of the song that we're singing it talks about breaking through the veil of darkness. It talks about a love that tears the veil of darkness. See, that's what it seems Mephibosheth was living under. Listen carefully. It seems that, well, in his dark season, in Lodabar, where there was no word, where he was in bondage, it seems it affected the way he saw. When it came to God's purpose, his eyes were veiled. When it's dark, and many people have been through tough and dark times, not only does fear, fear flourish in the night, but many times, in night times, you start seeing things. Start seeing things that weren't even there. When David shows relentless love to Mephibosheth, what does he say? He says, what has your servant, you know, what have you got to do with a dead dog like I. He described himself as a dead dog. Can I tell you there's no dead dogs in this room? No dead dogs in this room. Maybe there's areas of your life that look like a dog. Maybe the car you're driving out there, it looks like a dog. But can I tell you, you're better off, like Solomon said, to be a live dog than a dead lion. I would rather pass for a church that was a live dog. In other words, maybe we don't have the facilities and the resources to do all we're called to do. Uh, but a, you know, a dead lion, a dead lion, something that represents beautiful aesthetics and very cultured, very well-to-do people. If it's a dead lion, give me a live dog any time. Praise God. He saw himself as a dead dog because his eyes were veiled. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'll finish with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, talking about the work of Jesus Christ. And, well, that's what it says. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. It's true when it comes to the great eternal things, that the veil that keeps us from the presence of God, it is removed. The Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's why we don't can't allow ourselves to begin to be veiled in terms of the way that God sees us and start to be veiled in the way we see ourselves. Don't see things. There are no dead dogs. 
There are no dead dogs. You're a son of the king. You're a daughter of the king. You may be feeling very low. Maybe, naturally speaking, the bar is set very low. But his love is relentless. I've run out of time, but David, this is what he said. He said, Mephibosheth, what I've got for you is a seat at the king's table continually. Continually. Beautiful. There's a future for you. I'm lifting you up. You're coming up to the king's table. He brings you to his banqueting table. We are called to live, not according to the way we've seen ourselves, the shadows that have been cast, the shame that they may represent. We're not called to live according to the absence of the word and everything that that creates. We are called, called to live according to a relentless love that will come after you, that will pursue you, that is unceasing, unyielding, unforgiving. What a wonderful thing that is, unforgivingly forgiving. In other words, God, He's not even likely to look at looking for anything else but just keeping on loving you. His love is relentless. Praise God. Let's stand together across the church. Let's start to sing this song together. Your love is relentless. Sing it, church. your hands heavenward just hold them where you're comfortable and just for a moment recognize you're the recipient of a relentless love it's not based on performance it's unqualified it's not it's not something that has a limit it just keeps coming at you the love of Jesus comes at you comes at you comes at you if you've been casting shadows understand that the time has come for you to stop living in the shadows. If maybe you've been living where there's areas of your life that are close to the Word of God, open it up to the Word. God's Word is unchained. It is unchained. Lord, wherever there's chains in this place, I believe for the Word of the Lord. Father, to break the chains, your Word is unchained. Lord, I pray that if the veil of darkness has us seeing things different than the way you see us, help us to live according to the relentless love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, that unforgivingly forgiving love. Lord, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Lord, no natural thing, no spiritual thing. No angel, no principality, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Your love is relentless. Come on. thing to think about the love of Jesus. A relentless love. A relentless love. 
That love of Christ is the love he has for you today. Jesus, you know, he's, he's for you. He's on your side. He wants to fill you with the impact and the power of a relentless love. And if you've never really opened your life up to God's word, to Jesus himself, and I'm going to pray a prayer. And in this prayer, the end of the service right now, I'm going to believe for many people to make a choice. A choice to open your heart, open your life up to the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. A love which can smash through the power of sin, can smash through the power of our bondages or things that try to hold us and keep us bound and chained. It's a love that, well, it's relentless. Jesus displayed it on the cross. He displayed it in his resurrection life. He displays it. His commitment to allowing you to live according to a new covenant, a better covenant with a better promise and a better hope. If you've never known Jesus personally, if you've never made that conscious choice to open your life up to God, I don't believe you're here by chance. I believe you're here in the timing of the Holy Spirit. And I would encourage everyone to think about where you stand spiritually. Have you made that personal choice, that conscious choice to encounter Jesus, to open your life up to the love of God? Scripture says, if you ask him to come in, he'll come in and he'll live in you. It's a promise. He will live in you. What a wonderful thing when you think about the promise, the un unceasing, unbending, unyielding promise of God to give you a future and a hope through life of Jesus. I'm going to pray this prayer. The prayer I'm going to pray, I'll pray with everyone, but I'm believing for many different individuals here at Hills and if anyone else is still linked with us you as well if you've never personally made a choice inviting jesus christ into your life then i'd love it if you let me include you in this prayer i'm going to count to three in just a moment's time and when i do i'm going to ask people all over the room who have never really encountered jesus in a personal way you may know all about god you may even have a religious background but you've never really consciously invited jesus into your life i'm going to believe today for you to just encounter the relentless love of Jesus Christ. And if maybe you've known the Lord, but you're no longer living according to His Word. In other words, you're living dislocated from the will of God, not because of His choice. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. But you're making choices where maybe you're not allowing God's Word, God's Word to be the source of your life. And what that means, of course, is you're living where there is no Word. And if you live where there is no Word, you find yourself living as slaves in bondage to things that you simply don't want to be the things controlling your life. We're going to pray this prayer. Everyone who says, Brian, when you pray for people to connect with Jesus, when you pray for people to make a conscious choice to honor King Jesus, when you pray for people to get right with God, would you include me in that prayer? Then I'm going to pray the prayer. It's just one prayer. I'll pray with everyone. Let's have every eye closed, every person in prayer. When I count to three, every single person who would say, Brian, include me in that prayer. I want you to simply acknowledge it by lifting your hand. I believe you see hands all around the room. Then we'll pray this prayer together. You ready to respond? One, two, three. Lift them up. Powerful, beautiful, beautiful. Keep raising them wherever you are there. Keep raising them. Make that choice. You can see hands being raised around the room and I can tell you in this room you can never see all the people whose hands are raised because it's people stacked up against people but I can see people responding and I thank God for every single one of you if there's anyone else just join them quickly then we'll pray let's give these people a big congratulations a big congratulations and let's pray this prayer out loud together as a big church family. Pray these words. Dear Jesus, I make this decision to surrender to you every part of my life. Today is a new beginning. It's all because of Jesus that the power of sin is broken. I'm a child of God, a follower of Jesus Christ, a new creation. Thank you, Jesus, for your relentless love. It's a new day. In the name of the Lord, amen, amen, amen. Beautiful.
And those who raised your hand, we're going to give you a Bible. It's a gift from our church. It's a great, great magazine formatted Bible. It's beautiful. Well illustrated as well. And uh, if you raise your hand, we want to give you one of these. If uh, perhaps we missed you, and it's possible in a room like this, if you went to the information desk, talk to them there, they'll give you a Bible. See, it is a gift from Hillsong Church, but what it is, is the Word of God. And you start absorbing God's Word. Allow it to apply to your life. Remember, this can't be chained. God's Word cannot be chained. That's what the Bible says. So in other words, you let the Word of the Lord have free course in your life. And just watch what God can do. Give them one more big hand. Thank God for it. Beautiful. <laughs> I love Hillsong Church. I'm unabashed, unapologetic, completely biased. I am absolutely certain. And I've done worldwide research to confirm this is the best church on the whole corner of Newport, no, what is it? <laughs> Northwest Boulevard and Solon Circuit. The best church on the entire corner. And if you're in Brisbane, on all of Rover Street, which is 20 meters long, it is the best church that there is. Father, thank you for your promise. Thank you that you're a God who blesses your people. Lord, we thank you that you love your people. You keep them, that your face shines upon them. You fill their lives with your grace and favor. Thank you, Lord, that you're the God of the breakthrough. We thank you in Jesus' name that the Word of God cannot be applied. The, the Word of God cannot be chained. The Word of God cannot be chained in our lives this year. Lord, may the Word of the Lord have free cause in the hearts and lives of people. Have your way, you say. Lord, believing tonight and in this service, many people will be impacted by the power of a new beginning as salvation sounds a new beginning. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. You be blessed. Everybody, see you tonight.